All right. Good evening, everybody. Hope you're having a good afternoon, early evening out there. Um, I'm just going to give folks another 30 seconds or so to uh, to file in. We've already got 50 of you and growing quickly. And over 300 people are registered for tonight. So thanks so much for for being with us. All right, we're about to hit 100, so I'm just gonna go ahead and, and go for it. Um, thanks so much for being here this evening. Really happy to have you all. My name is Jamie Dawson. Uh, I am gonna be our MC for tonight's discussion. I'm the public lands campaigner for Oregon Wild, and I work specifically on furthering protections for public lands and waterways in Oregon. Uh, essentially ensuring that native species like lamprey and other fish and wildlife have a place to thrive. So this talk's really exciting for me. Um, I am very excited and honored to host two very smart people, wonderful presenters this evening. Uh, we've got Benjamin Clemens, Ben Clemens, um, who is the statewide lamprey coordinator for the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, and Todd Sween, who is a fisheries biologist for the Nez Perce tribe. Uh, Lindy from the tribe is also going to join us, but she's actually out in the fields right now working with lamprey, which is really exciting. So we will uh, we will give you give her a free pass for tonight. Hopefully we can host her again another time. Uh, before we get started, a couple housekeeping items. Um, as some of you probably know, I am hosting this webcast from Central Oregon. Um, we have staff members all over the state, but I'm in Bend. And Bend is the traditional homelands of the Wasco, Warm Springs, and Paiute people. Um, I'd like to offer gratitude for the land itself and for those who have lived here in Oregon since time immemorial. Not just the forests, the rivers, mountains, and deserts that those of us at Oregon Wild celebrate and work to conserve, but also places of art and industry, science, commerce, and community that are built upon these lands. I'd like to acknowledge the continuing presence of Indigenous peoples on the land today and the historical events, including colonial legacies and wrongdoings like forest removal that have long listing and current impacts. With that in mind, I am so excited to learn more about lamprey, which is a species of great cultural importance to many folks in the Pacific Northwest. If you missed part of this talk or you wanna share it with friends, a recording of this program will be emailed out tomorrow um, to anyone who registered for it. And we'll also post it on our website, OregonWild.org, in the Wild blog. And last but certainly not least, um, please ask questions for our presenters throughout the program. We usually get a flood of questions at the end, but if something you know pops in your head in the middle, feel free to just submit it at that time. We usually get a huge flood of them, so it's hard to wade through them all. Um, so, you, and down at the bottom of your screen, you should be able to see a little kind of a question bubble or a text bubble hit that and you can put your question in there and we'll try and get to as many of them at the end as we can. So without uh, further ado, I'll go ahead and pass it off to Ben Clemens who will get us started this evening. Ben? Hey, good evening. My name is Ben Clemens. I'm the statewide lamprey coordinator for the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen, Jamie. I noticed there was a couple of comments in the chat that some folks are only seeing a black screen. So um, I don't know if we wanna maybe just test that once I share. Yeah, sometimes a couple people in the beginning normally have various okay. tech issues. So I'll, I'll check in with them. But it looks okay, great, this cool. is the presentation. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and so, uh, Again, I'm the statewide lamprey coordinator, and I'm going to talk with you a bit about lampreys of Oregon. I work at the nexus of policy, research, and management to conserve all of our native lampreys in the state of Oregon. Before we proceed, I want to start with defining what exactly a lamprey is, because not everybody knows. Uh, here's a picture of a, a one species of lamprey at the top. Compared with an eel, sometimes people confuse the two, but they are very different. Lampreys uh, arose as a lineage in the uh, paleontological record almost 400 million years ago and have uh, changed very little since that time. They look very similar uh, now as they did then. Um, they are also uh, are comprised of cartilage, which is the same tissue that's in your nose and ears, gives them some rigidity. 
uh, in, uh, in addition to other tissues. Um, they don't have paired side fins and they also don't have jaws. They have a sucker mouth. By contrast, eels are very different. Uh, they have jaws, they have bones in their bodies, they have paired fins and gill flaps compared with these seven branchial pores that lampreys have. Uh, lampreys use their sucker mouths to attach to surfaces to rest when they're not swimming. They also use their sucker mouths for feeding, and I'll get into more of that later. But before I go on, I want to recognize that uh, not everybody uh, realizes that uh, the lampreys we have are native, that they're supposed to be here, they are a, a good sign of water quality, and that there's been no records whatsoever of lamprey attaching to humans in fresh water. Here's a brief video showing a Pacific lamprey swimming uh, in the water. You can see how they swim. Lamprey have not won beauty contests, um, probably because uh, their uh, resemblance to snakes and their sucker mouths. But again, this is all very natural. That's why I show in this uh, contrast in uh, perceptions of lamprey. Some people think they're the world's most disgusting animals on the planet. Contrast that with uh, the Oregon Zoo's ad campaign for their Pacific lamprey exhibit, The Cuteness is Coming. I think it's fair to say that a lot of the uh, perceptions of uh, lampreys that are negative are due to the invasive sea lamprey in the Great Lakes, which is uh, a very different species than the species we have out here. And there's a good view of the sucker mouths. It's a little bit off-putting and kind of vampirish to some, but again, these animals won't hurt you. And just want to cue it up from a, a Native American perspective. The Native American tribes have led the research, management, and use of, of lampreys and have touted their importance and brought many of us online with that. And this is a picture of the late Elmer Crow elder of the Nez Pierce tribe. And I think he said it best when he said the lamprey is our elder. Without him, the circle of life is broken. And what Elmer is referring to is the Pacific lamprey, the Native American tribes harvest and use for multiple uses. And Todd Sween will provide more details on that in the next talk. I did want to briefly mention the different species we have here. We do have more than just Pacific lamprey, which is the largest at just around three feet in length. Um, we also have these other species that are ranged from about a foot in length down to about a half a foot in length. And those uh, five species that are in bold here are species for which we have conservation plans in the state of Oregon and also status assessments. So these five species are all uh, have been ranked as sensitive species in the state of Oregon. With that being said, and with the time limitations from here on out, I'm going to focus on Pacific lamprey. Here's a distribution map in Oregon. Uh, blue denotes their current distribution and red is their historic distribution. So basically any water body with access to the ocean where the lamp Pacific lamprey can complete its life cycle, uh, wherever that happens and they can occur, at some point they have occurred. Now the red lines are the historic distribution and uh, not uncoincidentally, those are associated with river impoundments or artificial obstructions, uh, that is dams. So I'm gonna spend the bulk of this presentation talking about the complex biology of Pacific lamprey We've already discussed what a lamprey is, their status and distribution. And at the end, I'll briefly talk about uh, limiting factors and threats and conservation and restoration. So talking about the life cycle of lamprey for Pacific lamprey, here it is in its totality. Um, as adults, they spawn in fresh water in gravels of streams. Um, they, they construct nests and spawn. Um, they can have uh, a fecundity of 150,000 to 200,000 eggs. So pretty, pretty phenomenal. These are very tiny eggs, maybe a millimeter in diameter. But when the larvae um, emerge, they emerge within about a month of fertilization of the eggs. 
and they're just a few millimeters long. We call them eyelashes because that's about the size they are. But yeah, it's about a month that they will emerge from those nests and drift downstream. And that time period can be uh, longer if it's colder water or shorter if it's warmer water. And they settle out in areas that have very low uh, flowing water and that have sandy substrates that they can burrow into like earthworms. And these larvae don't have eyes or teeth. And what they do is they filter feed in the water column. And I'll get into more of those details a bit later. But somewhere on the order of three to 10 years uh, in this life stage, they will get the right constellation of physiological cues and environmental cues to cause them to smolt into juveniles that have eyes and sharp teeth and that drift and swim downstream towards the ocean where they can reside for one to six years parasitizing various fishes and whales. Now, um, that, I understand that can creep people out and they wonder why we would conserve an animal with such a life history. But I wanna emphasize that there's no evidence that Pacific lamprey kill their hosts and that it's probably not an evolutionary smart strategy to do so. Um, the hosts provide transportation in the marine environment for Pacific lamprey. And we do know that they switch prey as they grow bigger. The lamprey will latch onto the side of the host with their sucker mouths, rasp a small hole, and consume some blood before it drops off and goes on to a different species. And then when they've reached a maximum size of approximately three feet, they will return to fresh water to complete their life cycle. So with that all being said, I want to focus on the parasitic life stage and then move to the rest of the life stages in clockwise fashion. So in the ocean, here are some specimens that have been collected by NOAA fisheries surveys. And these are obviously two different size classes. The specimens on the bottom are very likely within their first year of entering the ocean. And then you can see that they grow like gangbusters. Look how much bigger they get. So that ocean uh, stage really serves to get them to that uh, spawning adult stage where the bigger they are, the more fecundity they will have. And I'd like to refer to lampreys as ecosystem integrators. And that's really for a number of reasons, two of which are the number of predators they sustain, 41 documented so far, and the number of prey that they parasitize, 32 documented to date. Now, Pacific lamprey are basically like swimming bacon cheeseburgers. Again, they don't have bones, and they have a caloric content that's three to six times higher than salmon and steelhead. So it's not hard to imagine that for these reasons, they're probably a preferred prey source for birds and fishes and marine mammals and uh, river otter and mink and raccoons, etc. In fact, there's a hypothesis out there that for these reasons, a Pacific lamprey may be a predation buffer for salmon and steelhead. So uh, for every time that these animals are consuming Pacific lamprey, you can imagine salmon steelhead are getting by towards spawning grounds. And on the other side of the equation with the prey, what the lamprey are basically doing is acquiring marine derived nutrients that they will take into fresh water to help feed and sustain those systems that are good once again for salmon and steelhead and multiple other species. And pictures are worth a thousand words. Um, and I love to show these pictures. I've got the credits for the photographers at the bottom. These say more than I could describe in five minutes. Here you see a picture of a California sea lion and a bald eagle uh, playing tug of war with the Pacific lamprey in the nearshore ocean. Here's a picture of an osprey getting a Pacific lamprey. And for those adults that bypass, somehow get through that predatory gauntlet, they'll land into the surf and go into fresh water. And now I'll get into this a bit later, but um, the, one of the things about lamprey that's bizarre to a lot of people is that although their life cycle is a little analogous to salmon that go out to the ocean and come back to fresh water, one of the things that's really different is that Pacific lamprey don't orient or home to the streams from which they were born. It's kind of opportunistic where they drop off their hosts and what freshwater streams they will enter. 
And again, I'll get into that a bit more later. Here's some examples of the predation that can occur on adults in freshwater. Again, California sea lions and tail races of dams, river otters, northern pike minnow. And again, this is by no means an exhaustive list, but uh, these animals, when they get a chance, they'll go for Pacific lamprey. Here's a picture of Willamette Falls in Oregon City in Oregon, the source of the largest tribal harvest of Pacific lamprey on the west coast of North America. It falls like Willamette Falls and other falls, the lamprey will aggregate and congregate, and this provides an opportunity for Native Americans to harvest them. And, and, they, and they do so, they can just grab them by hand, they need uh, cotton gloves to grab them because otherwise they're too slippery and will escape. Um, they used to be harvested here for use as bait for um, white sturgeon fishing, but that is no longer legal. And we participated in a large collaboration uh, tracking radio tagged adult Pacific lamprey on the Willamette. And so um, there has been other telemetry studies on tagged lamprey in the Columbia and other rivers. But what I, I'm going to get into here is a bit more details on our Willamette Basin tracking. So for animals, for the lamprey that have evaded predation and harvest, uh, they migrate up the Willamette Falls or through the fish ladder and uh, can be found in the following areas, wherever their structure, rock revetments, boulders, logs, root wads, areas that likely provide a little bit of uh, um, respite for them from swimming and uh, hopefully uh, provide some uh, cover from predation from sturgeon and, and other animals. Um, I mentioned earlier that I was gonna talk about the orientation of lamprey to fresh water and that they didn't home to natal streams. Here's a cartoon of larval lamprey in the substrate. And I'm showing that because it's been uh, found that they will release a pheromone out into the water column that the adults will attract to. So um, this is one uh, way to attract adults to areas to say, this is a good place to rear your kids. However, um, when people learn this, they often focus on that and think that you always need larval lamprey present to get adults back into those streams if there's no barriers present. That's not always the case. It, um, it has been shown in some tributaries to the Columbia after barriers have been removed that Pacific lamprey can fairly rapidly uh, recolonize those habitats. And here's a picture of my friend standing at the uh, downstream end of a pool just above where a riffle begins. And that's the general location where Pacific lamprey like to make nests and spawn. Here's an example of the Pacific lamprey nest with a lamprey in it. Um, it's a round indentation and they will grab onto the rocks with their mouths and move them out of the way and use their tails and, and the current to help create the impression before they spawn. Here's some adults, males on the top, female on the bottom um, that I've uh, collected during my research. Um, the thing I want to point out here is once again that they don't have bones and that they're not feeding when they're in fresh water. They've stopped that back in, in the marine environment and they funnel that energy toward their gametes. So for instance, this female, all this is a big ovary. As I mentioned earlier, 150 to 200,000 eggs. So these animals shrink 18 to 31 percent in length and that, as they funnel that energy into making those uh, um, eggs and sperm. And here's a brief video I want to show of two Pacific lamprey creating a nest and, and spawning. And uh, the neat thing here is that see them creating that area, digging it out. And then these are dace on the side waiting to dart in and get the aquatic insects that get released from the rocks that the lamprey move. It's been shown that um, endangered uh, coho on the Oregon coast will also do a similar thing. They go in there and eat the uh, insects that the lamprey free. And so the more we look, the more connections we see between lamprey and many other species. It's been shown in some studies too that this creation of microhabitats does tend to create more aquatic insects nearby that juvenile salmon feed on. So all very, very cool. 
After they spawn, the adults die. And here's a good example of marine derived nutrients feeding the freshwater system. You see a crayfish getting ready to consume parts of this carcass. Here's another carcass with some algae on it and some caddis flies. Very cool stuff. Now on the other part of the life cycle, the larval, the larval stage, I mentioned earlier, they like to settle out in slow moving uh, pools or areas that have soft sandy substrate. Here's a good example of that. And here's a, a illustration showing what they look like in that environment. If you had them on like an ant farm kind of enclosure, you can see how they burrow down and studies have shown that the larval lamprey burrow like earthworms and do increase the oxygen content in the substrate, which is beneficial to aquatic insects and other parts of the food web. So we see, once again, more evidence of being an ecosystem integrator. Here's a picture of actual larval lamprey feeding. And so you see their mouths and heads coming up out of the bottom. There's a mouth there with a hood. You see their branchial pores, and they're actively feeding. And uh, anecdotally, I have a colleague that has put them in a tank that was full of algae. And within a fairly short amount of time, it cleared the water column up. So you can just imagine that they're, what they're doing is recycling nutrients, cleaning up the water column as they feed on algae, uh, and bacteria, and other microorganisms. Here's a couple of pictures of, of larval lamprey, what I like to call the eyelash stage, as I mentioned earlier, at less than one inch, and shown to scale against a, a more typical sized, older, larger, larval lamprey in about six inches. And, and note the lack of eyes, and here are the branchial pores, here's the mouth. At this stage, they're, um, you know, they're, I wouldn't say quite bacon cheeseburgers, but they're still very high fat content. So like a really fat noodle dipped in cheese or chocolate fondue, if you will. Here's some examples of various predators eating larval lamprey. Everything from garter snakes during dewatering to crayfish, look at that larval lamprey there, cutthroat trout, northern pike minnow, sculpin, gulls, look at just chock full of lamprey, green heron. And this again is not an exhaustive list. And I can imagine some viewers are probably imagining, wow, they look like rubber worms, that'd be good bait to use. Uh, it would be good bait, but it is uh, definitely illegal. And now coming towards the end of the presentation here, I want to briefly talk about limiting factors and then on a positive note with the actions through conservation and restoration that many people and organizations are taking to mitigate these threats and limiting factors. So here's a, a, a list of some of the main threats and limiting factors, including artificial obstructions like uh, dams um, that, that block access to upstream spawning and rearing sites, and that also simplify river flows, culverts that also are barriers. This may not look like a barrier to many folks, but uh, please note that if there's any kind of gap between the culvert and the stream, that lamprey can't descend that because they can't jump, unlike salmon. Furthermore, if this doesn't have a stream bed simulation design, there may be no cue for them to move further upstream. Another big one, is the degradation of physical habitat within the rivers and alongside the shorelines. Here's an example of a highly simplified system that really becomes sterilized because it's basically a ditch funneling all nutrients energy out and with little interaction between the river and the shorelines, which is needed uh, for many different reasons. Here's a picture of larval lamprey that have been dewatered. So lack of water is another uh, key limiting factor. Um, water quality, like very high water temperatures. At this case, I think it was like 22 or 24 degrees Celsius, which is um, close to 80 degrees. Uh, lamprey can't handle that. Chemical spill is also not a good thing. And then last but not least, invasive warm water fishes like smallmouth bass that are increasing in their range expansions. And they have been shown through research to really hoover up larval lamprey. Uh, some actions taken uh, 
Uh, plans to uh, conserve and restore rather Pacific lamprey are as follows. There is the Tribal Pacific Lamprey Restoration Plan via the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission, the Pacific Lamprey Conservation Initiative, organized by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service with a number of partners, including tribes and various other organizations like my agency. And then my agency's plan, the Conservation Plan for Lampreys. And I uh, just want to mention that these are all working at different kind of hierarchical scales and they're all supplementary to each other. Three more, three or four more slides to go. Some of the actions called for in these plans include increased outreach. One of the many examples of that is the new uh, ODFW Native Lampreys of Oregon brochure that we have put out. If you're interested in that, just Google ODFW Lamprey brochure and you should be able to easily find the web page. Another example is lamprey passage structures, which are aluminum flumes at some dams. Here's an example of one of the flumes at Bonneville Dam. And this shows a couple of things, the burst and attach movement of the lamprey, the fact that they can uh, ascend inclined surfaces if there's a bit of flow, and this is one of the strategies to get these lamprey above the, the dams. And uh, I believe Todd will talk about other strategies such as translocation. But this, this is a pretty short and, and very instructive video. Um, the lamprey is resting right now, getting up the energy to burst forward a few inches. And then it'll continue on up into the structure. I don't know about you, but that makes me feel good. Uh, other actions include habitat restoration, the focus being more on process-based restoration and less on, and less on band-aid fixes, such as just dumping gravel and calling it good. Here's one example, the state zero restoration in the South Fork Mackenzie. Um, we believe that it probably has a number of benefits for spawning and rearing lamprey, but we don't know exactly um, what that means. So we're currently in the process with a multiple collaboration in studying that. And last but not least, uh, research, uh, especially learning the distribution of where uh, various lamprey species occur and where they don't occur and figuring out threats and limiting factors as to why that is. Of course, there's many other actions that we and others are undertaking, but these are some of the highlights that uh, I wish to share in our brief time together. And with that, that's the end of my presentation and look forward to seeing Todd's. Thank you. Fascinating, Ben. As long as I've been working in the field, I've uh, learned a lot more. Always something to learn. Working Thanks, Todd. Work. Can you see my screen all right? Right now we see the um, the slide with the notes. So we've got your your the Nez Perce Tribe Lamprey Translocation Initiative, and then it shows the next slide and the little notes below it. So it seems like maybe it's been switched, the screens. Yeah, let me see. Lindy coached me through this one, and I am drawing a blank as to where that was. If you maybe try exiting out of presentation mode, um, if you can, I remember she showed you a, a way on your computer. Or yeah, try display settings. Let's see what that is. Thanks everybody for bearing with us. Yeah. I'm sure this isn't the first time that- uh, A newbie at Zoom, I'm sorry. That's okay. We don't expect lamprey biologists to be expert uh, <laughs> tech people. Yeah, what about um, the display settings? So it's in that top left corner of your screen. There, like but it's, okay, there we Stop. go. Yeah, try that. Okay, let's try that. How are we now? Perfect. Looks okay. great. Okay, here we go. Well, I'm Todd Swain with Nez Perce Tribe Fisheries, and I'm going to present on our Lamprey Translocation Initiative. This, uh, excuse me, let me go back to the one. I've been a project leader with the tribe for 22 years, 
and 15 years in this role as a translocation lead. I have to say I was dragged screaming and kicking by uh, Elmer Crow, who then referred to into uh, this lamprey work. I, he was a tribal elder who had been on the same project I was. And uh, this work started out as a moonlighting job as our day job was stock, uh, project stocking trout ponds. Lindy Warden, who is listed on here and was going to be a speaker with us today, uh, got roped into, uh, we had to reshuffle the deck and she's actually still out on a lamprey collection run down to John Day Dam. But in the reshuffling of the deck, we incorporated some of her presentation on tribal perspectives uh, into mine. So I'll do my best. Um, this map indicates the range of the uh, Pacific lamprey in the North Pacific marine environment during the juvenile phase of the life history. Lamprey from the Snake River Basin in Idaho have been found off of Alaska as a result of DNA analysis of bottom fish trawls samples from the Bering Sea. You can see that the range is pretty extensive from Baja California to Japan. This map displays the imperiled conservation status of Pacific lamprey across most of the watersheds of the West Coast and in the Columbia Basin and in the Snake River drainages in particular up here in Nez Perce country which are in imminent danger of extirpation or at critically imperiled status at best, as the orange and red areas shown indicate as being at the highest levels of risk. And this map shows the historical homelands of the Nez Perce tribe, the Nimipu, as they refer to the Nez Perce in the Nez Perce language, Nimipu team. This is in, uh, as the map shows, present day Northeast Oregon, Southeast Washington and North Central Idaho. The map shows the reduction in size of the Nez Perce lands from the tribe's historic land use represented by the light tan color uh, as, show, as uh, described by the Indian Claims Commission to the Treaty of the 1855 boundary, which is outlined in blue in the map and then with the current reservation of the 1863, uh, 1863 treaty in the dark orange. Um, our Nez Perce Pro Fisheries Program is using translocation as a tool to stabilize and increase populations in this region, which uh, as noted by the previous map are at high risk of extirpation. Indeed, many of the tributaries that are program targets for release of translocated adults are selected because of local extirpation. This map shows the three lower Columbia dams where we collect the lamprey, Bonneville, the Dalles, and John Day. Uh, they're circled in blue, as well as McNary Dam, and then the four Snake River dams outlined by the blue box. These eight dams are obstacles to upstream passage for adult spawners and pose a major hazard since approximately 50% of the fish do not make it past each successive dams. So if you do the math, it leaves very few spawners to make it up and reproduce, especially up here in the Nez Perce country. As recently as 2009, only a dozen lamprey made it over Lower Granite Dam, the last dam along the migration corridor before the prime spawning habitat found in tributaries of the Clearwater and Salmon Rivers of the Nez Perce homeland. Lamprey, or Hasu in the tribal language Nimi Putin, and apologies to Ben, um, but often referred to as eels by tribal members. They are collected from traps and transported past these dams on the Columbian Snake Rivers to the Nez Perce hatchery near Lenore, Idaho. Um, and like I said, I may use the term eel interchangeably in this presentation, so please bear with me. The inset photo is of tribal elder Elmer Crow, Elmer, as we jokingly called him, loading adult lamprey into a transport take aboard a pickup truck 
during one of the first translocation trips. Elmer was passionate in his dedication to returning Hasu eels to Nez Perce country and served to pass his passion on to many of the rest of us who continue to work. The, uh, this photo at Willamette Falls from 1913 indicates the magnitude of lamprey populations prior to construction of the federal hydropower system. Willamette Falls is one of the few remaining locations where harvest opportunities continue for tribal members. Until the Nez Perce reintroduction of lamprey into a Soton Creek in Southeast Washington, which is a traditional harvest site for the Nez Perce people, they were extirpated and remained in name only, a Soton meaning place of the eel in Nimi Putin. Threats. Some of the threats identified in the Net Tribal Pacific Lamprey Restoration Plan and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services Pacific Lamprey Conservation Initiative are listed here. Um, those were the ones referred to that Ben referred to. You can see adult passage, juvenile passage, adult being upriver passage, juvenile downstream passage, low abundance, lack of information, as well as lack of funding. Um, in the top photo, you can see the 90 degree angles used in fish ladder design and dam construction that pose passage problems for adults migrating from the ocean to freshwater tributaries to spawn. Since they use their oral disc and suction to attach and work their way upstream using the burst and attach swimming method that Ben described and showed in that short video clip. But they are swept away when they encounter these sharp edges and fast currents of water. Since they are utilizing only their fat reserves for energy and are not feeding in fresh water, they cannot survive many failed attempts. The bottom photo shows the flip side the downstream migration where juvenile lamprey are impinged on a bar screen at John Day Dam. The current lack of information on downstream juvenile passage at dams, including such glaring problems as these screens, hinders improving passage of juveniles from the freshwater rearing habitat to the ocean. Photos, uh, this is a photo of the East Fishway Ladder at the Dalles Dam. This structure is 1,800 feet in length, which is approximately a third of a mile long. As noted previously, adult lamprey repeatedly face weirs and other right angle structures at dams and in fish ladders that hinder progress during their upstream migration. Nez Perce Tribe Fisheries and other tribes of the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission, CRITFIC that Ben was referring to, working with are working with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to identify and fix upstream and downstream passage at the dams. So we're trying, but the scope of the problem and the limited funding available make this a daunting task that may take decades at the current pace. This is a picture. Uh, this slides from the Crit Fix Lamprey Mapper tool and shows the areas in the Columbia Basin where each of the member tribes, um, the Nez Perce in the circle in, in, in brown, the Umatilla in pink, Warm Springs in purple, and the Yakima tribe in green are working to restore lamprey populations in each of their respective tribal homelands. The tribes initiated much of the lamprey restoration work in large part due to their close relationship with and seasonal dependence on lamprey. This is our fish truck. Uh, Lindy is actually currently driving back uh, with a pretty good load of fish with a, a lamprey. It's show, it has a five, 400 gallon slip tank. Uh, here pictured atop the Dalles Dam. We use it to transport lamprey from the lower dams to the Nez Perce Tribal Hatchery. Weekly collections of up to 500 miles or more round trip begin in June and continue through the end of August, according to the timing of the migration run. 
Nez Perce Fishery staff member, and this is a picture of Lindy at the upper right, and a crit fix staff member, Devane Lewis, lower left, relying on a coordinated team effort to check a lamprey pot at the Dells Dam. In this photo, Nez Perce staff member, Ray Ellenwood, another member of our team, and crit fix staff are transferring lamprey from the crit fix truck to the Nez Perce truck using an eel, what we've referred to as an eel can, a special type of plastic can modified to hold adult lamprey. In this photo, we're transferring lamprey in the top left from the truck tank to holding tanks at the hatchery. In the lower left photo, note the attachment behavior uh, along the side of the tank right there along the water line. And then the photo at the right shows the social behavior of eels, lamprey congregated in the corner of the tank. These are the lamprey facilities at the tribal hatchery, including the eel shed in the top photo, which we use for short-term holding situations, such as during annual maintenance. And the eel building, the lamprey building, in the bottom photo, which we use for the longer term uh, overwintering. The overwinter holding operations at the hatchery are relatively straightforward since specific lamprey cease feeding once they enter freshwater. So, monitor, uh, so monitoring water quality and fish condition and behavior are the main focus during this period. Uh, visit to the, lamp, to the eel building is a favorite at the end of hatchery tours since lamprey are such a unique creatures and are always and always fascinating. We welcome visitors as educational outreach is an important component of our restoration efforts since lack of public awareness regarding the plight of native lamprey is another major obstacle to their recovery. Um, this slide shows three of the eight holding tanks inside the lamprey building at NPTH. The Nez Perce team, or Team Eel as we're called, Ray, Lindy, and I, have begun an additional release strategy, which we call direct release, returning, which is returning lamprey back into the river immediately following the translocation transport. This allows lamprey to continue their volitional migration upstream, and this strategy being in addition to the conventional strategy of holding fish over winter in tanks for release into the targeted tributaries in the spring. To minimize risk, we recently installed a water supply monitoring system, which alerts hatchery staff of any changes to water flow and any associated problems. This photo from inside the yield building at NPTH is a close-up of the alarm system components. The system also allows real-time continuous checks of the water supply from remote locations using a sensor phone app on a smartphone, which is pretty nice. Another aspect of our work is the uh, juvenile, the larval and juvenile sampling. In these photos at the top, uh, I have a high school teacher and students on a field trip assisting our team during the electrofish sampling at a site along the Clearwater River. The bottom photo shows Ray and Neil Espinosa uh, from our fisheries office in Joseph, Oregon, out your way, uh, working up specimens collected during larval electrofish sampling in the Wallawa River of Northeast Oregon. This photo shows larval lamprey Sometimes they're referred to as amacetes, which we collect during the electrofish sampling. Uh, to, parenthetically, Ben is currently leading an effort to standardize the nomenclature that we use in the lamprey world and try to minimize uh, use of confusing terms, but many are still in use. This is the next stage, uh, juvenile lamprey transformed from the larval stage with fully formed eyes, fins, and the sacral disc, sometimes referred to as 
macrothelmia, again, an, another term that has been used in the past. It is during this stage and in this form that most of the downstream migration occurs. Here we have a photo of uh, fishery staff, Laudis Shabala, a volunteer who was helping us, preparing to do a fall release of an adult lamprey into the Potlatch River of North Central Idaho. We actually had to break ice in order to do this operation. The underfunded uh, Nez Perce lamprey program has relied heavily on volunteer assistance in the past. This photo is of Ray uh, releasing adults into, the New into Newsom Creek, a tributary, tributary to the South Fork Clearwater River during a conventional spring release. Now you can note the eel can there that we're using. Uh, he's allowing the water to uh, acclimate acclimate the lamprey to the new water they'll be released in. Now we'll transition into Lindy's presentation, some of her slides, and I'll do my best. Uh, this diagram represents the Nez Perce seasonal round, depicting the plants, animals, and fish that the Nimupu people depend on from season to season throughout the course of the yearly cycle and displays the close relationship of the people to the land and ecosystem. Lindy's explanation of TEK, traditional ecological knowledge, is understanding the worldview of the people that it will affect the most. I guess an example of that is Elmer, Elmer Crow and his life experiences as a fisherman leading to his understanding of the need to restore lamprey for cultural and ecological reasons and then his knowledge of the streams, watersheds, and fish distribution, translating into the our Nez Perce fisheries plan for targeting certain regional tributaries for the translocation treatment. A key component of our work in relationship to this TEK perspective is the restoration of harvest. And the last slide, this brings us back around to this photo, which you saw earlier, and it's all. And this is all about harvest. In the left, the image on the left, eels at Willamette Falls, and you remember that photo. It was definitely a harvest opportunity then and there. The next photo, left on the foreground, shows Yakima tribe member Harry Tamalawash holding eels ready for roasting by open fire. My personal experience with that is something similar to tasting smoked salmon on the one hand and a hot dog boiled in butter on the other. Literally, my hands were just greasy after that, that one. And as uh, Ben was saying about the uh, bacon cheeseburger, uh, an analogy we use is a swimming sausage. Um, everything is trying to take a whack at eel. And it, again, can serve as a buffer because there's often that predatory preference for lamprey. Um, the other photo here, upper right, traditional method of roasting lamprey by campfire so that the fat could run, run off. And then the last is down there in the lower right, a Bannock family with their teepee and drying rack near the Snake River in Idaho, uh, photo of about, from about 1902. With that, I think that's the end of the, my presentation. And I think Jamie's going to come back on for a, to moderate a question and answer session. Yeah, thanks, Todd. And thanks for filling in for Lindy. You did a great job pinch hitting for her. Um, all right, yeah, your screen sharing's off. And then Ben, if you want to turn your camera back on, awesome. So we got a lot of questions and thanks to Ben for for getting to a bunch of them in the chat. We'll, we'll try and get a couple more answered in the last 10 minutes or so that we have here. Um, one question that I wanted to ask that I don't think you addressed or and no one else asked is they've got that circular mouth, but how do they actually eat? It, is it just sucking? And then do they have like a an enzyme, a digestive enzyme or something? Yeah, they, so that suck, sucker mouth attaches onto the fish and they have a tongue they call a tongue piston, it's hard cartilage and it rasps into the side, drills a hole, 
And then they have this anticoagulant called lamphedrine that helps the blood to flow. Uh, it may have some anesthetic qualities to keep the, the host from feeling pain so that it would, would try to get away. But yeah, that's basically how they do it. And then they can pump their gills to get the um, oxygen in and out of their gills while they're attached in that way. So cool. Thank you. Okay, uh, now on to audience questions. Thanks for entertaining my one nerdy question. Um, where in Oregon could one view, uh, view a lamprey or, or where is the greatest population of lamprey in the state? Um, so, I mean, th that's a, a, a good question. It, it depends on the species. It depends on the year, it depends on the life stage. I think my general answer is if I wanna talk about Pacific lamprey, which we focused on today, coastal Oregon and the lower Columbia is Todd did a great job in his presentation. They're not nearly as abundant in the upper Columbia and, and Snake because of the, the dams there. Okay. I might add, Ben, um, as you showed in your one slide about, uh, I think Portland Zoo, isn't it uh, that display there? They have a display or they used to anyway. Yeah, yeah. Good, good place for people to see lamprey. And they also occur at the High Desert Museum. Sometimes they'll have some adults in there too in their aquarium. Great, okay, thanks. Um, how long is their total lifespan on average? Um, it, I'll, I'll jump in here and Todd, feel free to cut me off if, if, you, if you have better info, but we don't really know because they're hard to age. They, they don't have a structure that we can age unlike salmon. But what we do know is that um, if we take their variable larval life stage and what we know about their variable ocean stage, it can be from below 10 years to about 13 to 14. Wow. Yeah, and I might add, Ben, that um, you know the work we're doing with crit fig geneticist, John Hess, it seems like we're rewriting a lot of those, both on both sides, on the larval through the macro or juvenile phase, you know, up to the adult. It's just, that's one of the interesting aspects of working with lamprey is it's constantly changing. We're constantly rewriting the rules and, and uh, so much. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm gonna combine two questions into one here. What is the overall success or, or how, is the, how is it going essentially, the Nez Perce Lamprey Translocation Program? And uh, do we generally have a good idea of what numbers of lamprey there are and um, what is the program hoping to accomplish, I guess? Well, I'll kind of address in reverse. Um, right now our efforts are primarily stopgap measures just to keep uh, local populations going, uh, that pheromone plume that Ben referred to, to keep attracting adults. The success is that everywhere we put, everywhere we've uh, released the adult lamprey, we've got documented evidence from those electrofish sampling of reproductive success. So it is working. It's just we have a lot of, uh, there's a lot of issues to address. Kind of maybe following up on that, um, someone else asked, how long have lamprey populations been declining and how quickly has it been happening? Well, then I, from what I know, um, almost from the start when Bonneville Dam went in in 1938 and then each successive dam, um, it's been like orders of magnitude to where, as I think I mentioned it in my slide, maybe I didn't, but, um, at the last dam closest here to Nez Perce country, Lower Granite, the day counts were down to 2000, down to 12 lamprey, adult lamprey passing over Lower Granite Dam again in 2009, which, you know, you're approaching extirpation, extinction, local. Someone asked, uh, are they related to leeches? <laughs> No. Okay. <laughs> no. no. Uh, leeches are invertebrates. They don't have a, a backbone. Um, lampreys are much more closely related to us. We're both vertebrates. And, and although lamprey don't have bones, they do have 
kind of um, a prototypical backbone, if you will, that's a few that's fused with cartilage. Like old school, free bone, fine kind of thing. Interesting. Okay. Um, you've mentioned already uh, counting them at dams or collecting them near dams and some electroshocking surveys, but uh, how are lamprey populations monitored? Well, through, through a variety of means, yeah, adult passage at the dams and then, um, you know, like you've mentioned, the electrofishing um, that we do in the tributaries. And that's kind of a fascinating thing. We're working, we're working the various agencies, Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, the tribes, uh, state fish and game agencies on coming to agreement in terms of distribution and, and protocols, um, sampling protocols, so we can get start to get a handle on numbers and metrics. But it's once again, one of those areas uh, really in flux, a lot of work going on there. Great, thank you. And we're happy just when we see one when where before there weren't any. So we're kind yeah. of at that phase. Any news is good news. Yes. Um, is there any, time length consistency with how long a lamprey will attach to a host before moving on to another host or another species? Uh, good question, uh, difficult to study and we don't have that information yet. Okay, TBD then on that one. Tune in next, uh, next webcast when we have all the answers maybe. <laughs> Um, are all the West Coast lamprey anadromous, and do they have the bacteria that salmon have that make canines sick? Good question. So there are 10 species of native lampreys in Oregon. Uh, only two of those are anadromous, that is, go to the ocean to parasitize hosts and then come back to spawn. Um, I don't believe they have that... Uh, critter that causes illness in dogs, but I don't know. I do know that that critter in salmon carcasses that dogs eat is, is not a bacteria. It's a different taxon. Okay. Um, question from a fish biologist here. How can us fish bios report any known lamprey observations in the field? Do you pull info from fish salvage permits? Uh, one place you can go is uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service has a Pacific Lamprey Conservation Initiative website. And then there's links there, Ben, I know, to uh, a lot of that sort of data uh, repositories as well as reporting data. So that's that's one, one area. Yeah, I, I, that's completely, that's accurate. I just wanted to add if folks have further questions on details on that, um, please feel free to contact us so we can point you in the right direction. Great. The question about harvest, do the tribes, uh, tribal members who harvest lamprey eat them or do they use them as bait and for other uses? And are, they, are, are lamprey only harvested by tribal members or allowed to be harvested by tribal members? Well, um, harvest opportunities are fewer and fewer. Um, there used to be harvest, even commercial harvest of lamprey, but I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, Ben, but it's uh, pretty much tribal members now just harvesting. Um, it's, like I said, fewer and fewer. Uh, the, the trends have been downward. And yes, the tribal members uh, consume them. Um, it used to be a very common food. Um, I don't think I pointed it out, uh, but in one of the slides of the seasonal round, um, lamprey is actually one of the uh, fish that are showing on there associated with a certain time of year. And uh, I've heard stories where, you know, the, the, the lamprey is so rich um, that it was, it was something that elders, you know, requested. Um, but again, unfortunately, uh, they're just, they're not available uh, this far up here in the Nez Perce. Uh, we're talking about trying to get some 
some uh, harvest going again, just so that it can stay as uh, part of the culture uh, for younger members. And just to tag on to that answer, um, some non-tribal folks do harvest them. Um, you can contact uh, our agency, uh, the, the, and that occurs at Willamette Falls. There's specific regulations around that. And the commercial harvest that Todd referred to has been um, outlawed in around about 2000. They used to, back in the day, used to harvest lots of them for many different uh, industrial uses, but that's no longer the case. And I also want to emphasize that um, although lamprey used to be harvested uh, for use as bait, once again, that is illegal. You no longer can do that. Yeah, and I do also want to add just real quickly, um, they were harvested for a variety of reasons, sustenance, food, but there was medicinal uh, uses being so fatty um, as balms and ointments, I believe. And like I said, my personal experience, I had it on my hands and uh, I asked Elmer, we were driving on a trip back with Fisher Board and he gave me that piece. And I asked him to give me a paper towel to wipe it off and he just laughed at me and in just moments it absorbed into my skin. So I guess now I'm part of, you know, I don't know, part of lamprey. Nice. Okay, well to close it out, um, final question here, two part question. Um, what impact would removing the four lower Snake River dams have on lamprey populations in our region? And uh, do either of you have a kind of a, a hopeful thing, something you're looking forward to for the rest of your careers uh, as you focus on lamprey? Well, what I'll say to that, that's to some extent a policy question to be addressed at a policy level, but the dams are, you know, one of the major obstacles um, in the way of restoring populations. And as I mentioned, I think in one of the slides, we're working with the Army Corps to address address uh, these various problems. And each dam is different, so there's not like one size fix all. And it's going to require a lot of time and money to fix them from a lamprey perspective. Um, so, you know. What we can be hopeful, we're, we're uh, moving forward, um, but it's a long road ahead, unfortunately. So Todd, uh, what do you look forward to at, at, as, you, at the end of, as you approach the end of your career, whenever that might be? The biggest thing I'd like to see is, I guess I'll put in a plug for something that we've termed the matrix. And it's simply a management tool that would allow us to put a timeline to, to identify all the problems, passage problems, both upstream for the adults and downstream for the juveniles, for the juvenile lamprey, and identify those and affix them to a timeline. So it's very transparent, that process, and uh, then work at another huge problem, which is, you know, the funding, keeping funding going to where we identify and then not just identify, but fix those problems. And uh, we are, we have, we have successes, but like I said, there's just such a long way to go. Yeah, uh, just to, from my perspective to answer, I appreciate that, Todd. From my perspective, just to answer that, I think you know, there's many targets that we're shooting for. And one of the main ones for me is connecting Oregonians to the diversity of animals and plants that we have in our, our state and how fortunate we are to have them. But that, uh, you know, what we need to do to band together to um, practice good conservation and education of others to keep these resources for others going into the future. Um, we've I think lampreys have a chance to make it, um, but, uh, and they're certainly tied to other parts of the ecosystem. So um, let's do the best we can. Yeah, and Ben, if I could just add to, um, another thing that gives me hope is we have some real talented and passionate uh, people coming along behind us to continue this work. 
And I guess another ray of hope is that uh, the public perception of lamprey. I've seen some real inroads as we've worked with people getting the word out through outreach and education like you just mentioned. And um, it's been positive. I think uh, there might be a groundswell of support to some of these efforts. So, and, and just like with this platform you, prevent, you provided for us, uh, Jamie and Rob for uh, uh, getting the word out. Yeah, happy to do it. And now everyone has their homework, you know, go, go back to your families and your, uh, your churches and your places of work and spread the word about how wonderful and maybe even cute, or at least very resilient and fascinating lamprey are. Um, yeah, the more the merrier. Everyone needs to join the lamprey party, it sounds like. Yeah, so. they're now, you're all members, honorary members of Team Eel. I love it. Well, thank you so much, Todd and Ben and Lindy for, you know, contributing to this presentation and being here tonight this evening. Um, I really appreciate it. And I thank you so much for your time and expertise. And thanks so much to everyone for uh, for joining us this evening. I hope you all have a wonderful night. Yeah. Thanks so thank much for coming. Have a good night, everyone. See ya.